Hi, well, thanks for inviting me. And, and Jesse, that was a wonderful talk. I really enjoyed getting to hear that. So um, anyway, I'm going to be telling you about um, uh, our studies on the D614G mutation and why we early on concluded that it was uh, probably increased transmission and then the phenotypic uh, changes that have been associated so far with it in, on, on the lab bench. Um, so basically, we, uh, <clears throat> we have the cell paper that we first published in the archives, which was quite controversial, but um, the, uh, I, I think it's um, proven to be a very interesting site, however you view um, the original analysis that identified it, and I, I view it favorably, obviously. But anyway, this particular site, um, D614 and Spike, um, changed to G, and in, this happened in um, late February, and it, is, it, it rapidly declined globally. So this is the frequency globally of the two forms of Spike, um, and this is at the point we published the subpaper. Now it's almost impossible to sample D614s out of Sing Singapore. There's the, the one holdout place in, in the globe. Um, and we found that it was associated um, with a, a couple of different aspects of uh, the biology that were consistent with increased transmission. In particular, um, there was a, uh, a indication of higher viral um, uh, genetic material in the upper respiratory tract of patients, and we found that it grows to higher titers and pseudotype virions. And Jesse gave a very nice explanation of some of the caveats of pseudotype virions. They're, they're an unnatural setting. But, but David Montefiore, I, I just want to point this out, um, has, has pointed out to me that, pseud that pseudotype and the live viruses aren't all that different on the lab bench in a way, because the live viruses, when you're testing them in a laboratory, also have to go into the same cell types and be produced in unnatural cells. And so um, it's not the same as an in vivo situation, even with live virus. And people are looking at this with live virus now, but um, they're not, they're, I'm hearing some of the talks, but they're not collaborators, so not gonna be presenting that data. Basically, here's the um, Gizade story, and uh, Gizade is just, to me, a, a, a human triumph. I, I love this, uh, that so many people are contributing sequences from all over the world. It's just stunning and how rapidly they get out. So there's usually a couple week lag, but basically um, Gizade was, oops, I'm sorry. Gizade was following um, this mutation uh, well before <laughs> um, anyone else, I think. And it's, it's the G clade um, in their studies and it, it travels with three other mutations. Um, early on in the epidemic, there were multiple clades. Um, you can see each of these forms the, the original form is the gray and two other clades that have pretty much completely gone away now. They didn't carry the 614 mutation. And then these three forms all carry the G614 mutation. The GR and the GH are subclades off the G which have additional mutations. Um, so it's, it's, it pretty much wiped out all of these different variants um, globally and now everything we're sampling carries the G and there are tens of thousands of sequences in GIS-8. So thank you everyone who contributes to this. Um, so here's the, the overview from the cell paper. Again, just to review, it's a single mutation um, and it's not in the, it's not in the ACE2 receptor binding domain, um, but it is associated with higher viral genetic material and with higher pseudotype assays. So, Okay, so this, I'm going to go over some of the figures in the paper and how we interpret them. And we have a website, um, cov.lanl.gov, and you can do any of these things with um, updated daily information out of GIS-8. Um, um, you can create maps and you can look at any mutation basically with some of these other tools, not with the maps, that's just for D614 so far. But this shows you prior to March 1st, there was very well established epidemics in many parts of the world. And the orange is always going to be the original form, and the blue is always going to be the G16 form. And you can see um, just within three weeks, the shift towards G614 had happened globally. And um, on, in the beginning of April, I, I looked at this and I started to get concerned about it because to me what was really striking is that places with very well-established um, epidemics would have these introduced. And yes, you have many introductions sometimes from travelers, but you would also have travelers, presumably, say in Washington state from um, the Pacific Rim or from um, other parts of the Western United States or Canada where you'd be getting orange in. And still it all went to blue um, very shortly. 
So we tried to look at this systematically. Um, what, when I published my archive paper, we had found uh, uh, well, uh, well over two dozen countries, and they all changed in this direction, many of them with extremely well-established um, original form epidemics. So it was the repetition of this coming into well-established epidemics where local transmission was probably very important that we found really striking. And um, for the cell paper, we figured out two ways to look at this systematically. And one of them are, are these plots where we search all of this aid and we look for every country where there is a significant change um, in the frequency over time. I can tell you how we do that in a second. We also create these plots where you can, um, and, and you guys can create these too on cove.lml.gov if you want to, where you can look at the, um, any, any mutation in the virus. You can look at its change over time at, in, in any country or continent. And so this is a, a weekly rolling average. And here you can see in Asia, for example, you have the original form um, starting out and then the original form is still dominant, but somewhere um, you start getting the shift and then finally the later samples are all the, the new form. Um, so there's maps of the world. And now this is, I just took this one out yesterday. So this is what it was like prior to March 1st. This is what it's like middle of March, middle of April, and currently um, this is Singapore. Okay, so how do you read this thing? Um, what we do is you can choose any level you want, continent, country, um, sub-country, or state, which would be something like Wales or Washington State or California, or counties and cities, and all that information's in GizAid. And you can, you can ask, is there a significant change in frequency of any mutation over time? And so we're looking at C614 now, and so I'm just gonna pull out King County in Washington. Um, so what we do is we find the first place where both are co-circulating, that first time point. And then we, we look at the relative frequency sampled prior to that time point. We wait two weeks because you have to have some transition time. And then we just look at the relative fre frequencies after two weeks. And if this is significantly different by a Fisher's test, then we pull it out and we consider it interesting. Um, so there had to be enough sequences um, to, to be statistically powered. There has to be both forms cross-circulating and there has to be a change to appear in these plots. And we tool through all of GizAid to find those situations. And at the time we published our cell paper, this was every, every one of those situations. And because they're these little paired columns, you can see the, the blue is increasing in virtually every place but Iceland um, in the, in, at the, and um, we were able to figure out Iceland because there was actually a bunch of sampling from Europe that caused um, the, the shift where they were not sampling locally, they were sampling visitors from Europe. And so we think we understand that one, but really every place we looked. So it was the repetition that, that was striking to us. If it had been in any small number of countries, we wouldn't have believed it was interesting. Um, this is a more current one. This is July 19th. If you do this now, there are 121 different um, places. It's all gone to the, um, the new form, the G form. Um, and there's only a couple of exceptions in the entire 121 cases. So um, anyway, this is continent, country, and county city level. So what does it look like when you don't have positive selection going on? Well, these things bounce up and down. They don't all go in one direction. That's just what we anticipated. So the other two clades that are co common, GR and GH, have additional mutations um, that, that are um, showing up in the world at high frequency. So GR is probably the most common subclade of G that's um, currently sampled. And part of the reason for that is it's very common in the UK and the UK are doing this amazing job. They have something like, I don't know, the last time I looked, it was something like 30,000 of the Gazette sequences were coming from the UK. So they've made this amazing effort um, and so that's why we have a lot of R, I think. But at any rate, what happens is if you do see a significant shift in a local region, and I just picked countries here, you can do this more uh, at a city level. If you like, you see the same thing. They go up and down. They don't always go down. Sometimes they go up and there's no statistical significance. Whereas with the G614, it always went one direction. And that was what we found compelling and um, why we felt that this is evidence of a, a selective effect. And the fact that we get rid of all of the other clades makes it even seem like a selective sweep. Um, so anyway, neither the GR clade nor the GH clade seems to be being selected. Um, they randomly go up and down and those are probably due to founder effects and maybe super spreader events, that kind of thing where you do see a shift in a local population. 
we devised another way of, of going through all of GIS-8 and looking at sites, and you can also do this on our website. So that, that way we had a two-week miss um, in the middle of the sampling period. With this tool, we actually look at the whole sampling period, and we do an isotonic logistic regression. And what this plot shows you is here in Sydney, for example, we had, um, this is the fraction of G614, and there was none of it in the beginning. And then the size of the circle represents the number of samples collected on a given day. And you can see that the proportion of G614 is going up. And you can see this is happening in Cambridge. And the, the only exceptions that we found here were Santa Clara County and Yakima. And if you give it enough time, Yakima also has shifted, for example. This was the time of the cell paper. And this is um, at the end of July. So it, it's also gone through the shift. It just hadn't progressed that far. So that, again, there were almost no exceptions to the pattern of increase globally at any, any geographic level. So we also made other kinds of figures to try to look at this. Um, and for example, here is, is Europe. And this is prior to March 1st. And this is March, this is you know um, three weeks later. And you're seeing a big shift towards blue. Um, some of the countries really uh, started out primarily with a, um, the G-clade epidemic like Italy and France, although there was a little bit of the original form in Italy. Um, and the changes, uh, the changes can't be observed here, obviously, because you're starting with the, um, the form that got selected everywhere else. Um, there are also countries where you have extremely well-established epidemics like Spain and Wales um, to start with. And as soon as this thing gets introduced within three weeks, it's shifted. And there's other places that are really too late to see the shift um, very well because of poor sampling. So this would, this would be an example, um, Norway. And the other point here is um, that in many places, the increasing prevalence continued well after stay-at-home um, orders. And so we'd be less likely to be travel events or uh, our large super spreader events um, causing a shift. So in any one locale, certainly, but it was, again, repetition. Um, here's an example from North America, um, Washington. Washington's also just been an incredible um, resource for the world, uh, and they've been doing an, an incredible amount of sequencing. So here are two examples, um, Snohomish County, Washington, King County. This is where Seattle is, and this is a neighboring um, county. And, and you can see the shift is happening where they had well-established epidemics. And just to think about this a little bit, because there's a lot of data from Washington, so it's enabling to do that. This is how many sequences they had on um, the March 24th date of this, the governor's stay home orders. And, um, and almost all of the sequences at that date that had been collected prior to that date were of the original Wuhan form. Um, this is the number of confirmed cases in that county. And recently there was a, a, a lovely study where people tried to look, use antibody um, diagnostics to go back and say um, how, many, how many true cases cases were there versus reported cases in different locations in the U.S. In Western Washington, that number is about 11.2. So in these two counties, there are probably about 20,000 COVID infections through March 24th. Um, and not greater than 95% of these were D614. Um, and still within a few weeks, you got the shift. So just kind of a, a gross logic suggests to me that there is going to be a, a lot of community um, spread here. It's not all about introductions um, from New York, which is what some of the people were concerned about with our report. They were saying, well, many people were getting coming in from New York. There's also people coming in from other places. Um, and it was really a very uh, raging epidemic at the time um, the shift started to happen with the original form present. And then, you know, we, we broke this down by region. So Australia was another case very, very well, oh, sorry. Uh, keep losing this, very well-established Wuhan form, and then it shifts um, in different cities, and here is the whole country. And in Asia, it's certainly the shift happened, but it started happening later. Um, so for example, Japan, again, a very well-established epidemic, and then it just shifted. Um, so that was, that was our epidemiological support, and I, I felt it was quite strong and still do. Um, but there was also something when we published our, our original archive paper, um, that it was associated with higher viral uh, loads in patients indicated by lower PCR cycle threshold. So this is, means that it's, when it's a lower cycle threshold, it's easier to detect. And these, these have got a lot of scatter in them. It's kind of a crude measure. It's a measure of RNA levels, not really um, 
active virus. Nonetheless, our, our friend um, Dushan De Silva in Sheffield, England, had 500 patients at the time of our archive paper and 1,000 at the time of our cell paper, and we found a highly significant effect. Um, they did shift methods um, in, in England because they needed to, uh, because of resources for kits, and the diff there was different sensitivities, but this, so we broke out the two different methods, and this is a highly significant finding. Um, and since then, three other groups have found this, so even though it's a crude measure, um, it's been found repeatedly now in Chicago and Washington and, and also um, in the UK by Volts et al. Um, I don't have a figure for that one. So there's, there's always this shift and it looks like a small number, but I think you can think of this being sort of on a log scale. So it's um, not that small. Happily, we found no association between the status and hospitalization frequency in our study. Um, hospitalization was highly correlated with your age and being male and others, many others have, have seen that. Um, but we didn't find uh, any association. These people were getting a uh, sequence from their, their diagnostic sample and, and Fushan knew if they were going into the hospital or if they were being sent home as outpatients or if they're going to the ICU. And so we found no significant association um, with these statuses and the known status of the um, 614 mutation. We did find a very weak trend um, for possibly an enrichment in the ICU and there's this interesting paper, and I'd actually done a similar analysis and found just what they found in, in uh, March, um, the Sara Flores and Cardozo. Um, they showed that if you look at the fatality rates with the um, case from different countries, there did seem to be a correlation with the frequency of G614 in the nation and the fatality rate um, through March while these things were changing. And I, I, I don't know, this is a very, this again is a crude measure um, because different countries use different methods for um, assessing uh, cases. And so the denominators can be very different in the way they're calculated in, in the different countries. But still this does leave open the possibility, the sort of borderline statistic in their findings that there might be some uh, correlation with severe disease. But anyway, I think if there is a correlation with disease, it, it's weak and many others uh, like us have found no correlation with hospitalization or mortality. So I think that that's very good news, um, basically. The other thing we published in our cell paper was um, spike is more infectious in pseudotype assays if it, um, if it has the G614 mutation. And this is found in Erica Ullman Sapphire's lab and in David Montefiore's lab. <clears throat> and others have reported this in the archives as well. So. All of the qualifications that, that Jesse just gave us about pseudotypes also apply here, but they were able to see this with a different platform backgrounds, so VSV versus lentiviruses and different cell types. And they always found that these, uh, these G mutations were more infectious. Um, Erica also showed at the time we published our cell paper that it, um, G614 spike was at least as neutralization sensitive as D614. She only had a handful of uh, sera, convalescent sera from um, San Diego. There seemed to be a slight shift where G is more sensitive, so shift to the right is more sensitive, but this is just a few patients we couldn't really say for sure. And so um, Drew Weissman and David Montefiore really have led this and, and I just helped them out a little bit with the analysis and figures. But we're finding that there is a, a marked increase in susceptibility to neutralization in viruses that have the mutation. So, um, so the first thing they looked at was uh, vaccine sera, and they, Andrew was using four different variants of spike. Some of them were just RBD and some of them were full spike. And he tested these in um, mice and in humans and in primates. And then David tested and compared the two different forms in the pseudotype assay. And the way to read these figures, um, they're bar charts because that's what our reviewer asked of us, but these are, these are now four groups of mice. And what Drew is trying to compare here is dose and delivery strategies. So it's ID versus IM, 10 micrograms versus 30 for the four different groups. And these are 10 mice, 10 mice, and here's the paired. Um, this is the, the G614 and here's the original Wuhan form. And you can see that there is a, a higher ID50 and higher ID50 means more sensitive um, in, in every single mouse, every one of these 40 mice, and it's highly significant. And this is a log scale, so the effect is about, over, across all 40 mice, about a five-fold effect.
Um, it's also more con more sensitive to convalescent sera than D614. So, so David called on our, our friend Thushan De Silva in Sheffield, and he had um, 70 convalescent sera, uh, where he knew the infecting strain, D614 and G614. And both, it didn't matter what the infecting strain was. Here's the D614 infection strain, G614. The, um, the new spike, the mutant spike was always um, more sensitive, and there's quite a few that just aren't aren't making a detectable response at, at all. Here's the IC50 level, and here's the I, I, I'm sorry, ID50 level and ID80 level. Um, so this um, this effect was again observed in Sierra, and here it was a it was on the order of about a twofold effect, and highly significant because we had a lot of Sierra. <laughs> um, I just wanted to point out uh, one thing. I just mentioned that a lot of the Sierra didn't have any detect detectable level of, of reactivity, but also there was a lot of incomplete neutralization. And the incomplete neutralization means that if the highest amount of sera that you use, you, you level off, you get it, you don't fully neutralize um, the clone pseudovirus that you're looking at. So there's something about the pseudovirus, maybe it's glycosylation, something about it that makes some- I'm going to two minutes if you can start to wrap okay. up. I will wrap up. Okay, so so anyway, I think this is maybe going to be an important effect for both vaccines and Sierra. And then this is the monoclonal antibody story. So David got some monoclonal antibodies from Peter Kwong, and this is the inverse situation. So IC50 means the lower values are more are, are it's a more sensitive virus, and in these R RBD binding antibodies, um, again the effect was um, such that she was more sensitive. In particular, it was it was 162 fold effect for this antibody, which binds just outside the RBD. We think we understand why. Um, and the reason uh, is because the, the one up confirmation is preferred with the G mutation, it stabilizes the one up confirmation. So Priyam Vada Acharya at Duke um, has, done, um, has done some structural studies and it's gone from 46% up in the D614 to 82% up with the mutant in hers and this exposes both the neutralizing antibody site and the receptor binding site. And, um, and at Los Alamos, uh, we've been doing molecular dynamic simulations in, in Nana Nana Karen's lab, and he sees the same kind of thing where G614 would be 75% up, um, and it, this is stabilized confirmation. So we think that's the effect. And I'm just gonna quickly um, go to a summary here. Why does this matter? Um, there, there is so much controversy over this mutation that there are a lot of people saying that we really shouldn't even be studying this because it couldn't possibly be real. But um, I think there's a lot of bandwidth to study this virus right now. We've got to understand it. And to me, this was very thought-provoking information. I was really glad people looked into it. Um, the virus certainly is different now, and it's we need to be using the, the contemporary form of the virus in our assays um, to assess vaccines and therapeutics. Um, I think that G614 is an inspiration for greater caution. I mean, we've, we've got a more transmissible virus that's, uh, I think, more transmissible. Um, and I think this could be used to, uh, to help us consider how we should be behaving as we re-enter the world. Um, and the, some of the things we found is it's more sensitive to polyclonal antibodies. It's more sensitive uh, to vaccine-raised neutralizing antibodies in sera and monoclonal antibodies at a level that actually impacts interpretation of these assays. One sort of side benefit that made David really happy was it was a lot easier to use in the pseudo pseudovirus assay because it's more sensitive, so it's more robust and reproducible and um, clearer. So he was happy to change to this virus. Not only is it the relevant one, but it, it also was easier to use. And another thing, this, this poses the possibility that it might be useful as a vaccine antigen because um, if it's more often the up confirmation, the neutralizing antibody sites are better exposed. So that's um, that's the end. I'll just tell you about this picture is we, we tried for a cell cover, we didn't get, we lost the competition, but I like the figure anyway. Um, so here are little coronaviruses in our wave and here's the old one and here's the new ones coming in and um, you can see the rest. And here, here are the mutations actually that go along with the virus. So that's the end of my talk. Happy to Thank take questions. Thank you for, uh, for a wonderful talk, huge amount of data. I have a question and then we'll open it up. Um, so I noticed you went through it quickly, but uh, in one of your slides, I think you showed uh, 
a fair amount of positivity at very high cycles, 35, uh, 36. And was that associated, do you know, with a specific uh, genotype, the B614, for example? And a related question is, and again, I might have missed this, but uh, are the different genotypes uh, equally uh, represented in asymptomatic versus symptomatic uh, individuals? Okay, th thanks for the question. So um, the, the second one is, it's all we had was the hospital score. Um, so hospitalization versus non, and we saw no association at all. So that was great. We found no clinical association with, with this mutation. And I, I think your question about the RT cycles is a really interesting question. And I only looked at the D614, G614, and we do see that association. So the G form is associated with higher, higher levels of, of viral RNA in the upper respiratory tract, certainly. Many labs have now confirmed that. So we, we showed it first, and at least three other laboratories have confirmed that. Um, I think it would be interesting to know whether any of those really high cycles, like the 35s or so on, uh, progress to lower cycles and also whether they become clinically uh, significant. Right. I, um, so so I, I don't know the answer to that question, and it would be interesting to look at it in more detail. I think that, that Thushan only had the one, uh, the, the one test, so we couldn't really do it over time, but that's something maybe the group in Washington could look at because I think they have more, more detail. Um, Rodney, you can unmute yourself and ask a question. Yes, thank you for a great talk. Um, I just wanted to ask a question about mutagenesis. Is there anything in the sequence that suggests how this mutation arose? Like, is it a slippage or is there a sequence maybe in, um, that it's being, that it's using as a template, et cetera? I think you understand what I'm asking. Right, I think it was just one spontaneous mutation. So since this was oh, a- Sorry, uh, Betty, to interrupt, can you unshare your slides? So great. Oh, yeah, sure. Sorry I about can... that, I shouldn't say. Yes, okay. Um, yeah, thank you. Uh, so this was just, so what happened with this mutation is it, it, it was one of, a, it went along with two others that were found in China and, and um, went from Wuhan to Germany, Bavaria, with just, a, it's a clade and it was just a spontaneous mutation. I mean, that's happening all the time in this virus, in every person a little bit. And um, well, actually quite a lot, but what you get past only there's one or two mutations maybe, but at any rate, this mutation just arose spontaneously as part of this clade. A fourth mutation was added that's in the um, polymerase. And so it's moving through the world as part of a clade. It's not spontaneously arising. And um, one of the things I think that we need to be careful of with the phylogenetics is recombination isn't only important in coronaviruses, it's also important in SARS-CoV-2. And I, we've, we can find it when we look, it's not hard. So I, so when it, when you find the clay disrupted, which is almost never, 99.99% of, of that G614 comes accompanied by the other three mutations. Um, if you see that clay disrupted, when we looked into it in a few cases, and it's hard to look into, so we only have done a few, it's been recombination that caused the disruption of the clay, not spontaneous mutation. Um, so it, that that's how it arose, and that's um, that's how to think about it. I think.